Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Namaste. Welcome to episode 145, I believe it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour or so, I'm going to be talking about things that are important to me, I think, are worthy of your attention. If you have any reactions to the show, feel free to email me directly. It's whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can leave a comment there, uh, or you can get the email address from there. And if you do email me, Please include something in the subject line, like, you know, left side of the aisle or your cable show or something, so I know it's not spam. And uh, be a little patient, because I'm a little slow about email, but I do answer. So, with that all out of the way, let's get to it. I'm going to start, as I always like to, we'll have some good news. I actually got good news on two fronts this week. Uh, The first bit of good news is from an area where there has been a pretty fair amount of good news over the last year or so, and that is the area of marriage equality. Uh, We have seen now the surest sign yet that, as I repeatedly said, this is an area where justice will come, and maybe even sooner than I thought. There's an article on the online news service, uh, Talking Points Memo, that notes that two years, just two years ago, Witless Romney was saying that he was against same-sex marriage and civil unions, and the chair of the Republican National Committee was telling people that that was in line with what the majority of Americans believe. Well, now, with polls showing a clear majority of Americans approving of same-sex marriage, and even a majority of Republicans under 50 approving of same-sex marriage, the Goppers are starting to realize that eh, being on the wrong side of history is not, let's say, in the long-term interest of the party. The result is, uh, while there have been some national Goppers who have uh, come around on same-sex marriage, even more important is the number of right-wing state legislators which have. Um, Some of them, uh, for example, like New Jersey Governor Chris Christie and uh, New Mexico Governor uh, Susana Martinez, have just kind of like stood aside and allowed same-sex marriage to come to their states. But there are other legislators in state legislatures who are openly opposing, openly bucking the, um, the official party line. One example the article cites is Oregon. Now, in 2004, Uh, voters passed an amendment to the state constitution to define marriage as one man and one woman. But just three years later, the legislature passed a bill recognizing same-sex domestic partnerships. And now there is a move, which right now looks like a successful move, to get on the ballot for this fall a referendum that would overturn that constitutional amendment. What's relevant here is that there are Republicans in the state, including at least one sitting member of the state legislature, who are supporting and in fact filming videos in support of this move. Jim Moore, who's a political science professor at uh, Pacific University in Oregon, uh, described this shift as a sea change in the last 10 years and actually says there's a very good chance that this initiative will pass. Meanwhile, in Indiana, now this was described by a top, uh, top GOP operative there as the last stand of states trying to write bans on same-sex marriage into their state constitutions. In Indiana, there is a bill now moving through the legislature to do just that. But the point is, even here, even in the last stand, even in Indiana, there is conservative opposition to this. Uh, A number of of Gopper mayors in the state, in fact, have expressed their opposition to this bill. Unfortunately, that hasn't been enough yet to stop it. It passed the state house, is moving to the state senate, but even in the state house, 11 conservative members voted against it, a number that would have been unthinkable just a couple of years ago. And in fact, the opponents in the House did actually manage to strike out part of the bill, a part that not only would ban same-sex marriages, but would also constitutionally ban civil unions and any other status, quote, identical or substantially similar to that of marriage, unquote. All of this news comes down to the same conclusion. Change is not only coming, it has already come. 
Famous right-winger William F. Buckley Jr. once described a conservative as a fellow who was standing athwart history yelling, stop. But the fact is, there's only so long you can do that before history will run right over you. And some of our right-wingers today are starting to realize that, and that is good news. Our other bit of good news uh, comes on the line of an update. Uh, that Iran sanctions bill I've mentioned a couple of times, you know, the one that would uh, essentially undermine the negotiations between Iran and a group of mostly Western nations wielding their Israel-driven paranoia about Iran's nuclear program. Well, that bill that would undermine the negotiations has stalled. After the initial flood of support in the Senate, where it looked as though uh, they might actually get a veto-proof number of co-sponsors, opposition stiffened at the White House, among Democratic Party leadership in the Senate, and even among some pundits and media outlets, including some rather unexpected ones. Now it appears this bill won't even come up for a vote. Now again, the negotiations with Iran consist of six nations basically bullying Iran over claims about a nuclear weapons program that those nations admit they don't even have any actual evidence exists. But, even so, given the existing climate, undermining those negotiations would increase the chance of a military confrontation with Iran, led either by Israel or the United States or both. And so the failure of this bill is actually good news. Now, there are two points related to this that I also wanted to raise. One is that this outcome has showed something of a weakening of the political power of the, Ismer of the American Israeli Public Act uh, Affairs Committee, or APAC. APAC is used to getting its way in Congress to the point that it generally gets pro-Israel resolutions of one sort or another passed unanimously. This year, it's helped to get $3.1 billion in American aid for Israel and has largely framed the public debate over Iran's program. Getting this uh, uh, bill passed, getting this sanctions bill passed, was a top legislative priority for AIPAC this year. But it wound up going head-to-head -head with the White House, and it lost. In what could only be described as a full retreat, AIPAC has stopped pressing Democratic members of the Senate to vote for it and is now even lamely claiming that they never actually were looking for a quick vote on the issue and kind of whined, what's more, well, maybe the bill will still pass someday if this and if that and if the other. Thing is, APAC's push on uh, sanctions on Iran had increasingly allied it with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's position and against that of President Obama. Or to put another way, it became increasingly allied with Israeli policy and against U.S. policy. Which I say, quite frankly, is also true of some of the supporters of this bill. Uh, on another point, you may recall that I said that by supporting this bill, the supporters are saying they did not actually want peace with Iran. Well, a couple of times today I'm going to get to say I told you so, and this is one of them. This is quoting from the New York Times coverage of the bill. Lawmakers confirm that the political climate on Capitol Hill has changed since the bill's sponsors and AIPAC made their push in December. Remember, I'm quoting the Times. Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, a staunch supporter of Israel, is one of 16 Democrats who signed on to the bill. Now, Mr. Blumenthal says the Senate should hold off on a vote to give Mr. Obama breathing room for diplomacy. There's been an unquestionable, undeniable shift in the perception of national security, Mr. Blumenthal said. I'm sensitive to the feelings, the resistance, the aversion of the general public to any kind of American military engagement. Which, in essence, it seems to me, admits that the bill was about precisely that. American military engagement with Iran. Not because it was good for the U.S., not because Americans wanted it, but because Israel wanted it. Frankly, for far too long, U.S. policy in the Middle East has been driven by the interest of Israel rather than the interest of the United States, or more importantly, rather than the interest of justice. 
Any sign of a political weakening on that front, any sign of a political weakening of APAC is a step toward changing that fact, and that is good news. All right, moving on from there, we've got an update to last week's Outrage of the Week, which was about Thomas' $8 billion man Perkins and his petulant crybaby whine about how the lower sorts are all just hating on him and how he felt like a Jew in Nazi Germany, except later he said he shouldn't have said that, but he supported the message, which, if it means anything, means that he thinks he is like a Jew in Nazi Germany, except he figured out he shouldn't actually say that out loud in those words. Well, it turns out he has a lot of company. For one, Michelle, really? Somebody still listens to me? Malkin, who sneered that criticism of Perkins came from a bullying epidemic and uh, engaged in by the grievance industry and from bottomless hatred of the rich. Fox Business uh, contributor Charles Payne blustered that the rich have justified rage, and the only thing wrong with Perkins' comparison to Nazi Germany was that it may be a few years ahead of the curve. And the Wall Street Journal, where Perkins' letter was published, it screeched in an editorial that the very fact that Perkins was criticized was proof that he was right about the rich being some kind of oppressed minority, and then went on with a paranoid rant about how the left was sicking journalists to trash, such as the Koch brothers, and federal agencies to shut them down. (laughs) If I'd only known we had such power. But the point again is, this is how they think of you. If you criticize them, it's because you hate them. If you resent the fact that they got rich on your labor and then threw you aside when you're no longer profitable to them and then turn around and call you lazy when you can't find another job, it's because they are threatened victims. If you think they should pay more in taxes because they can afford to, and in order to support the society which made their wealth possible, well, that just means you're a jealous loser. This is how they think of you. And don't you ever forget it. Okay, now it's time for one of our regular weekly features, the Clown Award, given for meritorious stupidity. This time, it's a group reward, a award going to all five Republican candidates in North Carolina who are vying for the party's nomination to challenge Senator Kay Hagan this fall. They all have been trying to outwing nut each other. Uh, for one example, two of them say President Obama could be impeached. Now, not surprisingly, all five are anti-choice, differing only in just how extreme they would be in banning abortions. One of them equated the drive to end abortion rights with ending slavery. And another bragged about how last summer he got severe restrictions on abortion clinics passed into law by attaching them at the last minute to a bill on motorcycle safety. All five favor a so-called personhood amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which would endow not just fetuses, but zygotes with all the rights of actual people. But all of that really is just typical wingnut stupidity. This award requires meritorious stupidity. So here it is. All five of these bozos say that the state of North Carolina has the authority to ban contraceptives. Now, in 1965, the the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Griswold v. Connecticut that it was an invasion of constitutionally protected privacy for the state to ban use of contraceptives by married couples. In 1972, in Eisenstadt v. Baird, the court extended that logic to cover unmarried couples as well. That is, for 42 years, it has been settled constitutional law that states cannot ban contraceptives. 42 years, and not one of these jackasses knew it. That is truly stupidity worthy of the Clown Award. And by the way, speaking of being twits, some people certainly proved the point in their reactions to that Coca-Cola ad during the Super Bowl. I'm sure you know about it, but just in case you've been living in a cave the past couple of weeks, the ad shows various people doing various things uh, to a soundtrack of America the Beautiful, sung in various languages, including, according to the website Language Log, English, Spanish, Caris Pueblo, Tagalog, Hindi, Senegalese, French, and Hebrew. 
And of course, the right wingers went ballistic over just outrage, this horrible affront to our America, where speak English is the actual national motto. Now, perhaps the best response to this came from John McIntyre, a columnist for the Baltimore Sun, who said he was actually encouraged by the whole thing. The ad, he said, meant that Coke had made the hard-headed business decision that diversity is where their customers are and will be, and the loathsome reaction showed by the nativist white racist proved that they are on the losing side of demography, and they know it. But my favorite reaction came from Glenn Bleck, who insisted he didn't like the ad because it was intended to divide us politically. Because, he said, that's all this ad is. It's in your face. And if you don't like it, if you're offended by it, you're a racist. <laughs> yes, you are. Let's take a break. And we're back. Okay, now, the, uh, the Keystone XL pipeline is back in the news. Now, I've talked about this several times, uh, most recently in December. Uh, this is the pipeline that's intended to carry some 830,000 gallons of tar sands oil uh, a day from Alberta, Canada, down to refineries in Texas, after which the refined oil would be sent overseas to be sold on the international market. The reason it's in the news again is that the State Department has issued its report on the pipeline. Now, the State Department was involved because the pipeline crosses an international boundary. Supporters of the pipeline are now saying that this report gives Barack Obama little option uh, but to approve the project, uh, when, and based on the spin that's being put on it, that would appear to be true. However, there is a real problem with this report in that it attempts to change the question being asked. It changes the subject at hand. See, here's the thing. In Obama's climate speech last June, he said that the Keystone XL pipeline would only be approved if it was in the national interest. And it would not be in the national interest if the project uh, does significantly exacerbate the problem of carbon pollution. Okay, fine. But what constitutes significant? Now, you have to remember that tar sands are the ugliest, dirtiest, messiest, gunkiest way of getting oil that there is. Uh, the stuff is so thick, so sludgy, so gummy that um, you actually have to you have to heat it up. You have to melt the stuff and mix it with water enough so that it will flow through a pipeline. The EPA has determined that on a well-to-tank basis, that is, you know, of course, the entire spectrum of, of production, oil from tar sands produces 82% more greenhouse gas emissions, the kind that cause global warming, 82% more greenhouse gas emissions than conventional crude oil does, nearly double the amount, which certainly sounds like a significant difference to me. However, the State Department, uh, that report, has its own answer to the question. It concluded that uh, the Keystone Pipeline would not significantly affect overall greenhouse gas emissions because the oil would be transported through other means if the pipeline is not built. In the words of the report, quoting, approval or denial of any one crude oil transport project, including the proposed project, is unlikely to significantly impact the rate of extraction in the oil sands or the continued demand for heavy crude oil at refiners in the United States. Which, frankly, to me, is like arguing that there's no significant risk to smoking cigarettes because one more cigarette is unlikely to significantly impact your risk of getting lung cancer. The point is, the report changed the question. Instead of asking if, uh, in the light of climate change, it's in our national interest to promote the use of the most dirtiest, most polluting source of oil that there is, it restricted the question to the means of transportation from the well to the refinery. And because the impact on greenhouse gas emissions by sending the gunk by pipeline is not significantly different from that of sending it by train, therefore the project has no significant impact on greenhouse gases, no impact on global warming. Put another way, the State Department considered the means of transportation, but gave no thought to what it was being transported, and changed the subject thereby to the benefit of big oil. 
As Jeffrey Sachs, director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University, put it, the report self-portrays the United States government as a helpless bystander to climate calamity and as trapped in the big oil status quo. And the thing is, the State Department maintained this attitude even as, as it was forced in the body of the report to admit that the Keystone XL pipeline will drive tar sands expansion and therefore accelerate climate change, which was supposed to be the question at issue. Remember, it was discussed by Obama in the context of climate change. Now, this isn't the last word on this project, and it does still face considerable opposition. But there are also powerful voices behind it, and, and, and in the wake of the State Department report, those voices are, are already using that report to push for a quick approval of the project. No doubt fearing with good reason that delays will allow the shortcomings and misdirections of the report to become more widely recognized. But if, as I personally think is true, Obama wants to support this project, wants to approve it, but wants to do it without getting too much backlash from his environmentalist supporters, this report could provide an opening for him to do exactly that. And for climate change, that would be a disaster. Or on another disaster, if you will. Back in September, there was a settlement emerging with Syria to destroy its stocks of chemical weapons. Now, at the time, I talked about how the U.S. had been taking steps to destroy its own stocks since the 1990s, that it had promised to complete that process by 2012, and it failed. In fact, the most recent forecast is that neutralizing our chemical weapons won't be completed until 2023, 11 years behind our own self-imposed deadline in a process that has already today taken about 20 years. And I urge you to keep that fact in mind when the first complaints came up, as they would, about Syria being behind schedule and destroying its old stocks. Well, I'm here today to say... I told you so. On January 30, the Secretary of War, Chuck Hagel, said he was concerned that Syria was behind schedule in turning over its chemical weapons for destruction and told reporters that Syria had to take responsibility for fulfilling its commitment. The U.S. Ambassador to the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which is running a joint mission with the U.N. to oversee the destruction of Syria's weapons, uh, our ambassador to that group, claimed that the effort had seriously languished and stalled and the spotlight was on Syria. That the agreement to reach these weapons was only, uh, was only reached on, uh, on September 27th and the deadline for completing the process is June 30th. But already the U.S., which is going to miss its own voluntary self-imposed deadline by 11 years, is already saber-rattling over a deadline for Syria, which hasn't even come yet. I told you so. By the way, something to put this in even more context, another nation which, like the U.S., voluntarily gave up its chemical weapons and destroyed them is Libya. I had just completed doing so at the end of January. It took a full 10 years to do so. Meanwhile, Syria is expected to get rid of all of its chemical weapons in less than nine months in the middle of a civil war. I cannot but wonder if that requirement was intended to be unattainable. By the way, just to make this abundantly clear, I am not defending Syrian dictator Bashir al-Assad against anything except the possibility that Syria is being set up to fail on the deadline for destroying its chemical weapons in order to justify inflicting more war, more bloodshed, more violence on that nation. In fact, uh, Bashir has just been found by Human Rights Watch to have been deliberately and unlawfully demolishing thousands of homes, including entire neighborhoods and opposition-held areas in Syria, as a form of collective punishment, which is just another war crime in his string of war crimes. All right, finally, we're going to wrap up with this week's Outrage of the Week. Uh, this week, uh, our Outrage of the Week might be called Chapter 2 of This is How They Think of You. Last week we had Thomas Perkins. This week we have Maureen Deckers, CEO of the multinational pharmaceutical corporation Bayer. In 2005, the FDA granted approval for a promising new cancer drug for treating late-stage kidney and liver cancer. The drug, called Nexavar, is now marketed by Bayer. 
The problem with the drug, as this often is the problem with drugs, is that it's incredibly expensive. On the international market, a year's supply of this drug costs about $69,000. In the US, it's $96,000. Now that's not a problem for the rich or for those fortunate enough to have good health insurance, uh, which shields them for most of the cost. But uh, it is a problem for the who knows how many around the world who could benefit from this medication but can't even dream, can't even imagine of uh, being able to afford it. Which is true, in fact, even here in the U.S., among the millions with no or inadequate health insurance who would face a cost roughly double that of the national median income. Well, India, where $69,000 is 41 times the country's annual per capita income, it has an answer. Patent laws there allow another company to produce a generic version of a drug if the brand name is not available at a price most people can afford. In 2012, Indian pharmaceutical company Natco Pharma Limited applied for a license and got it. It is now producing the generic version of, of Nexavar at a cost of just $177 a year. Enter Mr. Deckers. Besides the expected response of calling the court decision theft, even though it's entirely in line with, uh, with Indian patent law, which we can assume Bayer knew about, Deckers told a recent uh, financial conference that, quoting him, is this going to have a big effect on our business model? No, because we did not develop this product for the Indian market. We developed this product for Western patients who can afford it. In other words, what Decker said was, we don't give a damn about Indians or anyone else in the developing world. We don't give a damn about poor people, even though we could make a profit selling this drug at $177 a year, which we know because there is someone doing just that. We don't care. We only care about Westerners. In fact, we only care about Westerners who are rich enough or have insurance companies rich enough to, to afford our insanely inflated prices. And if you can't afford those prices, you can just go ahead and die in pain. That is how they think of you. And while Decker's attitude isn't a surprise, considering a, uh, there was a 2012 report from Doctors Without Borders that found that most pharmaceutical companies devote only a small fraction of their budgets to fighting diseases that disproportionately affect poor people around the world. So it's not a surprise that changes neither the cold-hearted indifference he showed or the fact that this is an outrage. All right, that's it for this week. We're out of here. We're going to be back next week. In the meantime, you have the best week you possibly can, and peace.